Hello, everybody. My name is Björn Dübel, and I'm working at TU Dresden in the Operating Systems Group. And I'm doing my PhD in Operating Systems Fault Tolerance, and this is what I'm going to talk about in today's two sessions. Um, first, when we talk about uh, fault tolerance, there's this famous uh, Murphy's Law, which sum, uh, summed up says, if something can go wrong, it really will go wrong even though Mr. Murphy f uh, formulated it a bit um, more sophisticatedly. Um, he said, if there's more than one possible outcome of a job or a task, and one of those outcomes will result in a disaster or an in undesirable consequence, then somebody uh, will do it that way. Um, we need to know that Edward Murphy actually worked for the United States Air Force at the time, and he was involved in building uh, new airplanes and uh, rockets. And so this guy obviously s seemed to know what he was talking about. So when we talk about today's software, uh, we also find that things go wrong all the time and we need to somehow uh, take care of that. And this is what I'm going to talk about in today's uh, two sessions. So at first, I'm going to have a look at how and why faults in the operating system are really that bad and what the problems are, how often do errors occur and so on. Thereafter, in the first session, we're going to have a look at a couple of fault-tolerant operating systems. And in the second session, I'm then going to talk about the other part. So the fault-tolerant operating systems usually care about fixing software errors or making the operating system tolerate applications that have software errors. Whereas in the second session, I'm going to talk about hardware errors and how these affect uh, the operating system. Okay, so why do we have operating system software errors? The first reason for that is that operating system and low-level system software usually is programmed in C or C++ and definitely in some low-level language that allows you to have things like pointers, which can be null and so on. And one of the common assumptions when you write C code is that, well, I have this pointer here and I know uh, exactly what I'm doing, so I know it's never going to be null and I don't need to perform any checking. And then someone else is going to call your function later on with a null pointer and your program is going to be screwed. And if you program in C, there's not a lot you can do about that. This is just happening all the time. The next thing is um, operating systems or systems in general um, have layers and you have some kind of low level hardware layer that is taking care of interacting with devices. You have some intermediate layer in the operating system that's implementing things like uh, file system stacks or um, network stacks. And then you have some layers on, on top of that that implement the actual uh, collaboration with the user and then you have applications again with different layers and at this point um, a lot of things come down to sorry um, a lot of things come down to um, delegating responsibility so how do I know that if I'm writing a device driver for instance in the operating system I'm responsible for checking certain assertions that should be made. For, for instance, if someone passes me a pointer, should I do the check or can I assume that some higher level file system implementation, for instance, already did this check? And people are doing this wrong all the time. Um, the third thing is we have concurrency on the operating system. In today's multi-core systems, you already see this problem at the uh, application level where you have applications uh, consisting of multiple threads and they're accessing shared resources and at this point you can have two threads running on two different CPUs and they can access uh, some global variable and depending on which thread accesses this variable first um, you see different results in your application and so one, some of these results may actually be wrong. In the operating system we have this uh, same problem already if we are only running on one core, because in the operating system we have things like interrupts that can occur anytime something's executing. And for instance, you can have some operating system service, such as the file system, executing some code, but then an interrupt happens and the interrupt handler is ac accessing data that is shared with the file system. And so you can even have this concurrency issues uh, on a single CPU in the operating system. And this is definitely another problem to take care of. Uh, the next thing then is operating systems by their very nature are responsible for interacting with the hardware. And this means um, I'm ne I need to write a device driver and this means I need to trust that someone gives me a specification that if I want to send a network packet through my network interface, then I have to write a certain 
variable into a certain device register. And sometimes, unfortunately, these device specifications are wrong. And if this happens, you're basically lost unless you have a direct contact to the hardware vendor, because if something goes wrong there, then you have a problem. And the last reason is, uh, which we see all the time in dealing with operating systems, is hypocrisy, unfortunately. Um, operating systems, people tend to think themselves of being better than normal application software developers. So uh, the usual thing is, hey, I'm this cool operating system hacker and I'm writing in C the device specific code all the time. And obviously my programs will be much better than the Java programs that are developed at the uh, application level. And this unfortunately leads to a state of mind where Operating systems, people tend to forget about testing their code, thinking about concurrency issues and all the other things. And this is something we can do something about because this is purely psychological and we need to be aware of the fact that we are not better developers just because we're doing operating systems. But still, that's something to think about. Okay, so um, now that we talked about the high level reasons why things can go wrong, let's have a look at hard data. And there is a classic study um, that was done in 2001 by some guys in the US. And uh, these people were working on software that does automatic detection of errors. You can imagine this as some tool that is a uh, part of your compiler. And whenever you compile your program, this compiler does some additional checks, such as uh, when you access a pointer, have you made sure that this pointer is not null by performing a null pointer check before? Or when you free a pointer that was previously allocated with malloc, then it makes sure the compiler checks that um, you're not using this pointer after freeing it, because this is an error as well. And this happens all the time. And Given their set of tools, which they implemented and which today are commercialized and you can buy them from a company called Coverity, um, they targeted the Linux kernel. And actually they targeted all Linux versions from 1.0 until 2.4, which was the current Linux kernel in 2001. And they ran their tools on the Linux kernel to find all the errors these tools were able to find. And then they had a look at where these errors are, how they are distributed across the kernel, how long across Linux versions they survive. And they also try to figure out whether they cluster in certain locations. Um, obviously, 2001 is some time ago. And we cannot be sure if the findings of this study still hold today. And therefore, there was another study done in 2011, which was called Faults in Linux 10 Years Later. And the people in this study actually tried to redo the work from the classic study and repeat the analysis until the then recent Linux version, which was 2.6.34. So they had a look at 10 more years of uh, Linux kernel development. And their argument was, well, it's been 10 years since this classical study. Some things must have changed because people have been working on implementing tools that decrease errors, that detect errors better, that improve how code is written. So something must have changed in between. And here's what people found out. So this is a figure from the 2011 study, which has a look at uh, the number of lines of code in the Linux kernel and uh, its distribution across different subsystems of the kernel. And uh, we see here that, for one, uh, we're currently at 8 million, maybe even more than 8 million lines of code, which is quite a lot. So the, the Linux kernel is a really huge software project. And uh, the colors indicate which are the parts of the kernel the most code goes into. And we have this big red thing which grows and grows and grows all the time. And this is device drivers. And obviously, um, device drivers are the largest contributor to Linux code. So num numbers uh, range between two thirds of the Linux code or up to 75% of the Linux code are actually made up of device drivers. Um, and the reason for this is, of course, there are millions and millions of devices out there which need to be supported. And probably if you're running this, uh, a single Linux kernel, you're not going to use all this code, but you're only going to use the few device drivers that are actually relevant for your platform. But unfortunately, people use different platforms every day. So we have to have all these device drivers in there. And if you look at this, then of course, we would expect that device drivers also contain most errors in the code. Because uh, given no other information, we'd expect errors to be distributed equally across the Linux kernel. And if drivers have the most code, then of course, they also would have the most errors. Um, the 2001 and 2011 studies on 
Kernel errors went a bit further. They not only counted the absolute number of errors they could find in the kernel, but they also computed a relative number. And this relative number is taken by taking the average number of errors you find in the kernel and taking the number of errors you find in a specific subsystem. And here we, for instance, see that in the device drivers category, we have an error rate which is higher than one all the time. So in all different error categories, which are the single columns of this uh, diagram, we see that device drivers contain uh, more errors than the average code in the Linux kernel. And in some cases, this even goes up to four times or seven times as many errors than you would average uh, expect in average. Um, we see other parts like file systems, the networking stack, um, and other, which includes uh, sound and so on, um, contain less errors. Uh, the architecture-specific code, again, contains a high amount of certain errors, like five times more than uh, the average uh, error count, which is to be expected because the architectural code is responsible for uh, working with the hardware and you have to program it in assembly language, which is for most people harder than writing code in C. So we're seeing more errors here. And the other thing is device drivers are really a problem, not only given the amount of device drivers we have in the kernel, but also um, given that they contain more errors than average. This study was repeated in 2011. And they again had a look at different kind of subsystems. And uh, 10 years after the initial studies and after 10 years of research on how to improve um, kernel code quality, unfortunately, we see that uh, device drivers still contain a large amount of errors. So we still have eight times the average amount of errors for certain um, error types. We have four times as many errors here. And in other subsystems, we see this a much lower relative rate of uh, failures. So what happened in the 10 years in between? We don't know because things haven't changed at all. Device drivers are still um, the most important or most vulnerable part of the kernel. Um, the studies then went on to have a look at how long bugs actually reside in the kernel. And this does not only if, um, match uh, to device drivers, but they also had uh, a look at different subsystems and they figured out that actually the average number uh, or the average time a bug resides between some programmer makes a mistake and some other programmer finds this mistake and, mistake and corrects this error is more than a year. Actually, the average time is about one and a half years, which is surprising because you're seeing um, kernel patches all the time and people work on that. However, if you think about it, then there are, of course, uh, some errors that are found immediately because they're hurting everyone. However, there are other errors which uh, get introduced in the kernel and which only trigger in some very complex and rare circumstances. And these are the errors that, which are hard to find because they may go unnoticed for a long time because simply no one is using this specific subsystem in this specific situation. And then at some point, two years later, someone pops up, hey, there's a bug here. And this is how these error distributions uh, are created. This is a fancy graph also from the 2011 paper, which uh, goes through the Linux kernel versions and shows the number of bugs that are inside um, one of these versions. So they're starting at 2.5 over here. And uh, the black line counts the absolute number of errors their tools were able to find between the different kernel versions. And then they had a look at when these errors were introduced, and we see that we have uh, rising lines until the point where a certain kernel is released, which is, this is the time where errors that go into a kernel version are uh, introduced. And the falling line behind then is the, is the time it takes to find those errors. And we see there's even like 2004 to 2010, and there are obviously errors which are in the blue lines down here and which get introduced until 2.6.20 and then they get removed. And there are still errors in 2.6.20 which can be found by tools and which have not been fixed yet. So this is a reality. And um, I hope that so far I convinced you that uh, faults in terms of software errors are actually an issue and that hardware related stuff such as architectural code and device drivers are the worst parts of the system and need to be taken much more care of. And in the second part of this lecture, I'm now going to have a look at what the operating system can do to improve on this situation. One example operating system you're going to find whenever 
um, people talk about fault tolerance and how to deal with it is a system called Minix 3. Minix 3 is a fault tolerant microkernel developed at the University of Amsterdam. And um, being a microkernel is already a good step towards uh, improving things because we're moving a lot of code that would actually be in the kernel uh, into separate user applications. And we're going to see that this is already imp an improvement towards uh, tolerating faults or making make the system more reliable. What the Linux, uh, the Minix kernel contains is the kernel itself and some additional um, tasks in there. So there is a clock task, which is the uh, timer device driver in the end, which drives the scheduling. And there's a system task, which is responsible to translate POSIX system calls into Minix system calls. So one, one of the design goals of Minix 3 is to provide some COSIX, POSIX con compatible layer. So you get all the nice system calls that are used from uh, when programming on Linux. But they're mapping this to a user level, to a client server based microkernel based operating system. And so what we have in the user space in Minix is a set of user pro processes such as your shell and make and any other things you might imagine you might want to use. And then we have server processes and device processes. Um, server processes are responsible for actually implementing the functionality that is used by the user applications. So for instance, there's a file server that's implementing a file system and that provides you with calls such as open, close, read or write. Um, there's a process manager which implements calls such as fork or exit. And then there are device processes which in a traditional operating system would be device drivers. So there is a process that takes care of interacting with the disk. There's something for providing uh, serial consoles. There is networking, printers and so on. Okay, so um, I already mentioned that Minix uses uh, this client server distribution and the microkernel approach to improve fault tolerance. And one thing you gain from running your microkernel components as user level applications is address space isolation. Um, compare this to Linux where all your device drivers, all your file system and network stacks and everything else you might want to be interested uh, is running inside one address space. And when one of your device drivers fails, um, it is free to fail in any kind it wants. It does not only need to crash your system, but it can also um, silently override all your process data or override some important data that's used for networking. And uh, by introducing address spaces between the different components, um, we are leveraging the hardware level uh, address space isolation to prevent that. Because now if we run our, uh, our device driver in a separate application, it has its own address space. And once it fails and starts overwriting memory, it will only override its own memory because it cannot longer access uh, the address space of other applications. So this is the first and uh, important step to improve uh, fault tolerance on MI or why microkernels give you better fault tolerance than traditional monolithic systems. Uh, the second thing um, Minix does is again a microkernel thing. They're moving user level or operating system services such as memory management or uh, file systems out of the kernel into user level services. Um, this is um, a gain in both security and reliability because it um, enforces something called the principle of least privilege. And if you um, did not hear that yet, uh, this concept comes from uh, the security world where um, people say if, if, if you want to have a real secure system, then what you need to do is give everyone participating in the system the least necessary privilege so that he can still achieve his goals. So he has all the privileges he needs to actually do some uh, important work. However, do not give this person any more privileges. And traditionally, systems are pretty bad at implementing the principle of least privileges because um, the mechanisms that allow you to implement security um, are not very uh, sophisticated. So for instance, in traditional Unix systems, you have access control lists and you can say, for instance, for files and any kind of other resources that they have an owner and a group and some rights for the others. But uh, this is not enough to enforce the principle of least privileges. And of course, um, Linux has improved on that, for instance, by implementing SE Linux, which adds uh, layers that allow you to way more fine grained specify who is able to access what. And in a microkernel, you simply get this for free by isolating all your components into separate applications that communicate through IPC messages and um, 
you probably already heard about Gnode and about Nova. And these are microkernels, or Nova is a microkernel that's uh, also using capability-based access control. And this also comes um, out of the direction that you want to have more fine-grained control over who is allowed to access certain resources. Um, the third part why Minix improves fault tolerance is that they're using small components. And there have been works that studied on what happens if actually your software encounters an error. And um, of course, with you as the user, uh, you see, well, there's a, a software error and my application crashes. But this is not all. The question is, what do you do then? And in most cases, as a user, if my application crashes, I'm going to restart this application. And depending on how large the state for this application is, restarting may take a long time or it may, take, may be very fast. And if you have a look at the whole system where your operating system currently crashes, then of course the same thing you do is you see your Windows blue screen, you push the reset button and your computer is rebooted. And um, some work studied these facts and figured out that if you can uh, create your system as a set of very small components, then if one of those components fails, you can easily replace it with a new version. For instance, by restarting this component or by letting some other component take over the work from this component. And um, this makes correcting an error that happened in your system uh, much faster because you do not anymore need to reboot your whole operating system or your whole computer, which may take several minutes if you have a modern multi-core machine. Um, but instead, you only replace a small component and you can be done with that within a second or even less. And this concept is called uh, making the system micro-rebootable. So every component on its own is able to be rebooted and this is called micro-reboot. Okay, so now that uh, we talked about the design principles that make Minix more fault tolerant, um, let's have a look at how they actually perform fault detection and uh, correction. So because this is what you actually need to do when you have a system that needs to deal with applications that can crash. Uh, the two things you need to do is you need to be able to detect that an application has crashed and you need to be able to correct this problem. And uh, Minix fault model, which describes what kind of uh, errors they expect from the applications, um, is uh, a transient error mold model, which they say stems from the fact that software has bugs. And these software bugs trigger at certain points in time because some specific situations occur. And uh, at this point, the application crashes. And the way Minix tries to fix um, so these software errors and the crashes caused by software errors is to restart the affected component. And to this end, they implement another server in their microkernel-based system, which is called the reincarnation server. And the reincarnation server monitors all the other applications in the system and is able to detect things such as um, that a program terminates because of a crash. In this case, it sees something like a segmentation fault exception. Um, uh, the server also sees CPU exceptions. For instance, if an application uh, executes a division by zero, which obviously is also a software art error. And as a last um, mechanism, they use something called heartbeat messages, where you can force an application to send a IPC message to the reincarnation server periodically, like every five seconds. And if the reincarnation server detects that this heartbeat message has not uh, arrived within the last period, then it may also conclude that the application has crashed or is uh, stuck in an inf infinite loop, and at this point may decide to restart the application. Um, so this is the general model. We have a specific server component that monitors applications for uh, signs that they may have an error. And we then fix this error by uh, restarting the application that's affected. Um, unfortunately, restarting an affected application is not always sufficient because um, restarting your application may lose data. Suppose your application is a text editor and you as the user have entered some text, but you did not uh, save this text into a file yet. At this point, if you simply, if your editor crashes and you re simply restart it, uh, you will be presented with a blank file again. And you lost all the state that you entered into the application, but did not save uh, into a file yet. Um, and this state is going to be lost after a component restart. So um, in Minix 3, um, they also provide additional mechanisms that allow applications to store such state um, at a dedicated server. 
Again, they introduce a new component, something they call a data store, and um, applications can store their internal state into this data store server. Um, this is some kind of a checkpointing mechanism you can think of. So the application knows which is the important state which it needs after being restarted. And um, this state is then stored at the data store server. And once the application crashes and is restarted, it can contact the data store server again and ask it to uh, retrieve this stored state. And thereby, for instance, in the file system, uh, in the editor example, uh, we would uh, retrieve this, uh, all the text that you entered into your uh, editor without the need of uh, restoring it from a file. Okay, so, um, so far we talked about Minix 3 and um, I told you about some design pr principles that enforce architectural isolation and that allow the uh, system to be more re reliable or more resilient against uh, software errors. And um, the important thing to take away is that in Minix 3, fault tolerance is explicit. Um, and explicit means that all everything related to fault tolerance um, must actually uh, be uh, or come from an application. So the application needs to take care of storing its state in the data store. There's the process manager, which needs to be notified whenever an application crashes and needs to explicitly reload the application. And uh, the application then needs to explicitly go to the data store server and retrieve its stored state, for instance. Um, another thing is that in a microkernel-based system, we, uh, you probably already know that we have client-server applications. and um, if a server, for instance, crashes and is restarted, the clients that use the server may still have connections to the server or have some uh, messages in flight. And these are all lost when you re simply restart the server. And in Minix 3, this is not a problem because everyone will get sent a signal at the point where um, the server is restarted. And the clients then need to explicitly handle the signal and restore their connection to the server. And in the next part, I'm going to talk about, about two other approaches um, which try to improve on this situation and try to relieve applications from having to deal with uh, the fact that everything around them may crash at runtime. Um, the first system I'd like to talk, uh, talk about is called CurieOS, um, which starts from the observation that recovering state after a restart, restart is actually fairly tricky. Um, in Minix 3, I told you we have this data store that's keeping track of you and allows you to retrieve your data. However, um, most of the time, an application is not in full control about uh, of all its state. For instance, if we have in our example here a server um, that is servicing two clients, A and B, then the server state will actually consist of uh, some internal server state as well as client-specific state for client A and for client B, which are somehow attached to the communication session that is open between the client and the server. Um, and this client state is problematic because um, in this picture, it looks like the state is completely stored at the server side. However, uh, it may actually be distributed across the server and the respective client. And if the server now crashes and is restarted, it cannot restore everything that is stored in this client state or everything that's related to the client-specific communication sessions. And CurieOS is an operating system that tries to help us with that. And in their case, what they do is they have an operating system kernel called Quick, and um, they come up with a special abstraction that is managed by the kernel. And it's something they call server state regions. And server state regions are actually the representation or memory regions that cont contain client state that is specific to a certain communication uh, session between a client and the server. And this client state belongs to a client. It's not actually visible to the client because uh, the server might not want the clients to see all the state it stores for security reasons, for instance. But um, we can imagine this client state being attached to a certain client application as a kernel mechanism. And what uh, Quick then does is um, it provides applications still with the possibility to make uh, send IPC messages to a server. And what then happens is when client A, for instance, calls um, the server, the kernel makes sure that client A state is um, mapped into the service address space. And at this point, the servers can start 
um, servicing the client's request um, can send a reply. And once this, the re reply is sent, the kernel removes the client state region of, server, uh, of the client A from the service address space. Same thing happens for client B. When client B sends a message, client B's state is then uh, made available to the server. So the server can again service client B's state. And if once a reply is sent, um, this uh, client state region is again removed from the service access. This already solves another problem because what happens now is that the server always only sees the state that is ac actually accessible uh, for a certain connection. And now if, for instance, client B sends a message which causes the server to crash because the server has a software error and this message actually triggers the software error, um, the server may still override internal state. So the server state may become corrupted or the client state for client B may, be, may, may become corrupted, but uh, client st the client state for client A is completely safe because it's not mapped into the service uh, address space. And thereby we get some additional protection by using the service state region um, kernel mechanism. Um, having a look at the actual implementation, CurioS is implemented as something called a single address space operating system. So what, what is a single space address space operating system? Well, every application in such an OS runs using the same page table, which means all applications have the uh, same memory layout. So for instance, if we have virtual memory here, then for all applications, we will have some segment containing OS data. We have, have some segments uh, containing data for application A and some segments in memory containing data for application B. The difference between the applications running is, the, or is that uh, in their page tables, they will have different access rights set. So when application A is running, um, it has access rights set so that it can access um, the memory regions for A and maybe also the OS, but it will not have access to B's data. Same thing is when B is running, we will run with a page table that allows access to the memory regions in program B, but not in program A. Um, this also still allows uh, sharing memory by simply setting up a page table where, for instance, in the lower example here, we have access to the regions for application A, but we also have access to a uh, region for application B. Um, so th the main advantage of a single address based operating system is that we have this identical page table layout and we don't need to flush any caches in between when switching between applications. Um, but this is not relevant for fault tolerance. Uh, from a fault tolerance perspective, Curious uses single address based operating system because um, it allows to um, ease restart in an application. Because we have a single address space, um, every object in our system has a unique address. And this address is going to be the same across all address spaces of the applications. Um, and in CurioS, servers are now implemented as C++ objects, which means a server resides as a certain uh, at a certain memory address um, for all applications. And by sharing, allowing, allowing the sharing feature, we can give applications access to the server and they can then perform uh, calls to the server by simply calling a function of this C++ object. Um, when we now want to restart a failed server component in CurioS, uh, the only thing we need to do is we need to um, delete the memory where this C++ object resides and place a new C++ object of the same type at this location. Um, and this is cool because it's transparent to the clients. The client will, will probably never see that something changed in there because for the client, the C++ object implementing the server is still at the same location and the client is still performing function calls to certain locations. And um, restarting will, of course, remove the object for, for a certain time frame, and if the client performs a call in this time frame, it will maybe notice that uh, it raises a page fault and that execution is somehow um, delayed until the object is replaced, but the client does not need to make any additional work when the server object is replaced. So the client does not need to reestablish a connection. The client does not need to recover any client state because this is stored in the um, client state regions. So restarting objects in Curios becomes completely transparent for the client. Um, the third example I'm going to talk about is um, how we on the L4 runtime environment implemented uh, restart. And if we have a look at L4RE, 
we have a couple of components that are involved in loading and running applications. And one is the component loader, which is called NET. Um, and NET is able to already detect that an apl application terminates, for instance, because of a crash. Um, because once, if an application uh, in L4RE is uh, terminated, then the parent, which is the loader who created this application, is sent a signal. And so um, restart uh, can be implemented in the style similar to Minix 3. We can simply take the Lua script, which NET uses to start L4RE applications, and re-execute it. However, as Fiasco and FORE are a capability-based system, we have an additional problem, which is not present in the previous two examples, and this is capabilities. Um, unfortunately, capabilities are the references for everything that is working in the system, for instance, also for communication channels. And um, there is no single component in the system that knows about all the capabilities and knows about who is owning which capabilities to which objects, because this is obviously um, only the kernel, something only the kernel node should know. Um, and so at the restart point, um, the loader component may not be in the position to actually recover all communication channels. And so um, we implemented a framework that um, aids us in doing so. And to understand how this framework works, um, we need to have a look at how session creation actually works on L4. So I already talked about this loader component. And suppose now this loader component wants to create a client in the server and provide the client with a channel so that the client can co make calls to the server through the Fiasco IPC mechanism. In this case, um, when starting, the, the loader first creates something called a session creation capability, which is a kernel, a channel to uh, some kernel channel that allows us to create other kernel objects. Um, the first thing we do is um, the loader first creates this channel capability and makes it available to the server during startup. So the loader creates uh, this capability, which is a channel, and makes this channel available to the server. The server now possesses one communication channel, which is our uh, red session creation capability. In the next step, um, when setting up the client application, um, the loader performs a call through this uh, creation channel, notifying the server of the fact that we're now going to create a new client and that this client wants to have a new channel to talk to the server. As a result, the server creates a session capability. And this session capability represents the actual channel that is going to be used for communication between the client and the server. Um, this channel is created by the server. And after this has been done, um, the client can start running and the client can use this new session capability to send messages to the server. So now, uh, suppose the, client, the server crashes. What happens um, when the server crashes is that um, it calls exit or terminates in any other way. The loader will get notified and the loader destroys all the kernel objects belonging to the server. Um, so afterwards, um, everything is removed and the loader can then restart um, the server application and the server is running again. However, there's one thing missing. We still have this uh, session capability in place. This capability has not been destroyed because the loader does not know anything about this capability and the client still has access to this capability. So the client still thinks there is a channel to my server and maybe later the client wants to use this capability to send a message to the server again. And at this point, uh, the, server, uh, the client will f find out, okay, this capability is not there anymore. I cannot talk to the server and will retrieve an error. And at this point, the client now is in the situation where it actually figures out, yeah, the server seems to have crashed or something other um, led to the point that I cannot contact the server anymore. And now the client needs to handle that. So this is not transparent as in QRIOS, but it still um, uh, requires handling at the client side. And this is what uh, we implemented uh, in a framework called L4 Reanimator. Um, what we can do with F4 Reanimator is we can already detect that an application has crashed and we can restart the application. But the, uh, regarding capabilities, only the application that is allowed to use a certain capability can also de detect that this capability vanished. And in our case, uh, this was the client application because only the client application has access to the server communication channel. And so only the client will be able to detect that this 
this channel has actually vanished. Um, what happens when some uh, when such a capability goes away is that the next time the uh, client tries to call the server, um, we are going to, we are going to see a, something called a capability fault, which is simply an error message you retrieve uh, when sending a, an IPC message through a channel, and the application, the client application then needs to perform steps necessary to create a new channel so it can talk again to the server. Um, this is described in a, software uh, in a software function which we call a capability fault handler. And this capability fault handler is an application specific function because it needs um, to know um, what kind of communication channel is there, how can I reestablish this, what, do I, what do I, steps do I need to take to reestablish the accompanying session state. And um, the programming model that is enforced by F4 Reanimator is that these capability fault handlers are actually implemented by the same per person that's also implementing the server application itself. Because as the server implementer, you usually provide clients with a library, for instance, that's taking care of any uh, complex uh, communication issues with the server. And part of this library can also be the capability fault handler that's responsible to um, the uh, to recover uh, vanished communication channels. We call this concept uh, semi-transparency because uh, as the server implementer, of course, we have to write code um, that allows us to uh, recreate the session. However, for the application developer, our intention is to make this transparent because at the application side, you simply use the library provided by the server implementer and you do not need to write any code of your own. Um, a last thing for reanimator takes care of is it also has a notion of uh, resources that are attached to certain channels. And um, these channels, uh, for instance, uh, are not only communication channels, but they may also be have, uh, have memory attached to them. For instance, if uh, we have a graphical console, there may be uh, the physical frame buffer attached to a certain communication channel. And at this point, if the channel vanishes, we also need to make sure that the attached resources are uh, freed at the point we detect that the channel has vanished. And this is what, where L4 Reanimator provides us with additional handlers, which we call unmap handlers, um, which can, can be used to um, free those attached resources if necessary. And again, they need to be provided by the server implementer because they are application specific and only the person writing the server knows what needs to be done at this point. So in summary, um, and I also told you about F4 Reanimator, which is somehow in between full transparency, such as provided by QRIOS and full explicit mechanisms, such as Minix 3. Um, and the main concepts here are we have capability faults that allow us to detect that a certain um, channel vanished. We have capability fault handlers, that, which are the functions that are application specific and know how to uh, reobtain a channel after a server crash. And we have unmap handlers that help us uh, cleaning up resources and uh, restoring the system to a sane state. Um, everything I talked about so far all only works uh, with respect to software errors. So the assumption is here, programmers make errors and these mistakes are triggered by certain messages sent to our server. However, um, they always assume that the hardware underneath our system is always functional correctly. And after the break in the next session, I'm going to talk about uh, operating systems and services that allow us to also deal with the fact that hardware is actually not as uh, error-free as we might like to expect. But um, that's all for now. And let's have a break and start later.